Hey, good morning, Arundel Christian Church. How are you? How many of you received something in the mail from me this week? Yes. Let me, uh, let me spend a moment talking about this idea, this, this thing called our One More Campaign. It probably had this logo on it at the top corner somewhere. Here's the deal. This website has been created all, about, all around this one idea. In the morning, all of our volunteers, we get together in the cafe. Not all of them, but the volunteers that are here at 8... Uh, at 9 o'clock, we get together in the cafe, and we, we kind of have this powwow together. We, we talk about what's going on that morning and kind of what we need to have our eyes on. And then we ask this question out loud. And if you're in this room right now and you know the answer, go ahead and shout it out. We say, what are we here for? One more. One more. And here's what we mean by that. There are 500,000 people within eight miles of this location on the map. And most of them, uh, a large majority of them, do not know the saving love of Jesus Christ. So what do we exist for as a church but to know that everything we do, it's to reach one more of those 500,000 that don't know Christ. And the whole idea behind switching the three services, the whole idea behind needing more people to be part of what we're doing here, all of that is geared around This idea of of helping one more learn about the love of Jesus. So here's what I'm asking for you to do with this one more campaign. It's very simple. You got a letter in the mail. If you didn't, now you're finding out about it from from me. I want you to go to arundelcc.org slash one more. And what it will do is it will tell you all about our transition into three services, what that's going to look like, when that's going to happen. And more importantly, we have a goal. We need 200 additional people serving on a Sunday morning. And what that means is that we really need to adopt this this simple thing. Attend one, serve one. Say that with me. Attend one, serve one. So what we're asking you to consider doing, if it's possible, if you have the, uh, the, the wherewithal or the means and the transportation to make this happen, we want to ask you to make Arundel Christian Church on Sunday mornings a two-hour commitment that you plan to be here to worship without any responsibilities, one hour, that's attend one, and another hour to stick around and serve somewhere in the building. And we have an incredible need for you. If you've ever wondered, like, I feel like I'm not needed, that's so not true, especially now. We need you. So go to arundelcc.org slash one more, and we will find a place for you to serve one Um, and find the right hour for you to attend one. All right, fair enough? So make sure you go and do that this week. We're trying to uh, compile all that data, and it's going to be awesome. So we are in week three of our sermon series called The Upside Down Kingdom. And this Upside Down Kingdom is a three-week journey through the Sermon on the Mount. And the first week we spent it uh, looking at Matthew chapter 5. And last week we were talking about humility in Matthew chapter 6. And today we're looking at Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to tell you, we could go, we could take a whole year and, and walk verse by verse through the Sermon on the Mount and not run out of incredible truth from Scripture. But we have been going through this at a, like a, a much faster pace. So at the end of this day, at the end of this message... There's going to be a lot from Matthew chapter 7 that I haven't covered. So I'm going to give you homework again. This week, make sure you spend some time in Matthew chapter 7. Because there are some incredible things in there. And I don't want you to think, hey, Matt didn't spend any time talking about this. So it must not be important. We know that all scripture is beneficial. So spend some time in in chapter 7 this week. Here's one of the coolest things about chapter 7. It does an incredible job in three different places showing that there are two different kingdoms. There is the upside down kingdom that we've been talking about. And there's the the right side up kingdom. The way that our kind of natural sinful inclination leans us to. The way we kind of do things most of the time. And in Matthew chapter 7, one really cool thing is there's three spots within this one chapter where we see two different choices. We see the upside down way and we see the right side up way. And it really highlights, and remember this is Jesus speaking. This is his sermon. He's highlighting the fact that there are 
choice, there's a choice we have to make. And we're also going to look this morning at, at what I call one of the scariest passages in all of the Bible. We've talked about this before, but we're going to spend more time on it today, so maybe it doesn't have to be so scary. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to whatever it is you want to, to say this morning. God, I pray that I would be a, a vessel, a mouthpiece that you, that you are able to use to communicate the truth of your word. That as I'm trying to do the best I can to explain what you were saying in your sermon, God, that I can do the best I can to explain it in a way that we can take it home and apply it and do something amazing with it in our lives. God, continue to transform us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. And while you're doing that, I just want to just, you know, obviously we're going to spend our morning in Matthew chapter 7. So open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. Go ahead and move your bookmark over to Matthew chapter 7. Get your thumb ready in Matthew chapter 7 because that's where we're going to spend some time. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, there is a Bible in the chair in front of you. So go ahead and grab one. If you don't own a Bible, now listen, I say this often. If you don't own a Bible, I want you to take that Bible, I want you to write your name in it, and now you own one. We want that to be a gift from us to you. And here's why. This is the most amazing book you can ever read. It is it's, it's incredible truth packed into this book. And if you don't own one... You ought to. So let us give that to you. Go ahead and put your name in it. And now you own a Bible. Matthew chapter 7. Here's the first thing we find in Matthew chapter 7. And if you're taking notes, this is kind of one of those things you want to write down. Number one is you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Remember I said that, that Matthew chapter 7 does an incredible job of highlighting the, the fact that there's two different ways. There's this or there's that. And then we go on a little bit further, and there's another this or that, another this or that. There is the upside-down kingdom, and there is the right-side-up kingdom. And what Jesus is really kind of pointing at through this, through this uh, last part of his sermon is you have a choice you have to make. We see it, uh, I'm going to show you just real quickly, in verses 13 and 14, you see uh, standing at a crossroads, and you have to decide, are you going to go this way or that in verses 15 to 19, we see two different trees, one bearing good fruit and one bearing bad fruit. In verses 22 through 27, we see that there's two different ways to build a home. You can build your home on a solid foundation of a rock, or you can build your home on the sand. But here's what the point is. You have to make a decision. There's this or that. There's no this, that, and the other. So all of us in this room, we have a decision to make that's something that I don't I want to put a lot of pressure on you, but I believe, because Scripture is very clear, that this is the most important decision you'll ever make. But it's a decision you have to make. Here's a second thing. Is that indecision is a decision. I remember uh, between my junior year and my senior year in college, I decided I wanted to propose to my wife. And she wasn't my wife then. That wouldn't have made sense. I wanted to propose to my then girlfriend, Melissa. And I had this, if you ever want to hear the story, it's pretty long. I don't have time to share it with you today. But it was elaborate and I had all these plans and things and lights and music. And I, I put a lot of thought into this. And the, there's one point we're in this park and there's this path, and my guitar is there, and then it's, it comes to this like this this point where this is the spot where I have to get down on my knee, and I got to actually ask the question. So imagine, right? If I get down on my knee, and maybe this has happened to some of you. I hope not, but maybe maybe it has. It didn't happen to me. Uh, I got down on my knee, and I looked up and I asked Melissa, "Will you marry me?" And luckily, man, I, I'm telling you what, I married up. For whatever reason. There were a couple screws loose in her head, and she said yes, and it was awesome. But imagine for a moment that she didn't say yes. Imagine for a moment that she had said, not no, but let me think about it. I'm going to tell you what, 
If she had said that, I would have walked away from that park that night as unengaged to be married as I was when I walked in. You see, that indecision is a decision. When you decide to not decide, you're ultimately choosing. Remember that, that, that illustration maybe from a couple months ago of sitting on a fence, saying, listen, I want to just sit on this fence. I don't want to decide if I want to be over here or be over here. That indecision, that sitting on the fence, we have to remember that Satan owns the fence. You have a decision to make, and indecision is a decision. That's very important for us to understand. We can actually see this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It says, Enter through the narrow gate, because the gate is wide and the way is spacious that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. But the gate is narrow and the way is difficult that leads to life. And there are few who find it. How many roads are there? There's two. I think the word radical, when you hear the word radical used especially in a religious connotation, doesn't it kind of bear with it that we kind of hear that and we think of like people who've done really like horrendous things in the name of religion? So we hear this word radical and we think it's a really, really bad thing. And we think, well, you know, radical, someone who's radical in their faith, that's not a good thing. But let me tell you what uh, Miriam Webster, the way the word is actually defined, it's defined very different from the usual or traditional. And if nothing else, I hope that you've understood that this upside down kingdom that Jesus is preaching about in this Sermon on the Mount is very different way of living from the usual or the traditional. It's a very radical way to live. And I think sometimes, especially in American Christianity, and I'm going to say American Christianity, there are plenty of other cultures that fall into this same category, but what we find often in the American church is people who who decide, listen, I don't want to be radical. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that, that weird guy. But I don't want to be like them either. So we've somehow invented this middle road. We've convinced ourselves, listen, that, those, that, that's just weird. I don't want to be like that. that. That's no way to find friends. That's a way to be like that guy at work. I don't want to be that guy, and I don't want to be like them. So I've invented this, this other way. I'm going to call it the middle road. And I want to remind you, Jesus is very clear. There is no middle road. There's a narrow road, a very unusual and different way And then there's the wide road that leads to destruction. And many are going to find that. We're called to be weird. Some of you, maybe you've thought this thought before. I believe in Jesus, but I'm afraid to be weird. And I want to challenge you that I think that fits into this category of indecision. It's choosing self over following Christ. It's choosing the wide road. It's choosing the easy way. Here's a third truth we find here is the right choice is hard, but so worth it. The right choice is hard, but it is incredibly worth it. I want to ask you this question. Has your faith caused you Any sacrifice in your life? Think through that question for just a moment. Has your faith caused any sacrifice in your life? Is there something you've had to give up? Is there a a relationship that you had to go away from? Is there something that you wanted for you that you had to say no to because you're a follower of Christ? Have you had to sacrifice in your life? Because the answer ought to be yes. In fact, we see in Romans 12.1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your reasonable act of worship. 
In other words, we have been called not only to be weird, but to, to the, the way that this is done, it's, it's not easy. Sacrifice is very hard. You even think about this. When you have this narrow road and this wide road, it's going to take a lot more precision and a lot more patience to go through the narrow gate than it is to just go the way that is wide open. It's going to be hard work. We see another example of this in Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. Let's read that together. It says, Watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are voracious wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorns or figs from thistles, are they? In the same way, every tree, every good tree, bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree is not able to bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree to bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will recognize them by their fruit. Fun fact about my wife and I, Our thumbs are anything but green. And every year, we think this is the year that we're going to get this right. Because we love the whole idea of a garden. So we usually pick out the things that are fairly easy uh, to do, that that tend to be hard to mess up. You know, we'll get a couple different tomato plants. We'll get uh, a zucchini plant. And we've, we've tried different things, and we'll, uh, right now we live in a townhouse, so everything we, all of our gardening is in pots, you know, on the, the, the deck. Uh, so that makes it a little tougher, but one thing I have learned is it is incredibly easy to get it wrong. I'm telling you, you just water it too much, water it too little, go on vacation and forget to tell anyone about them. We did that recently. Like, it is very easy to kill a tree. It is very easy to kill a plant. It is very easy to you even think like, man, I've got tomatoes growing out of this thing like crazy, but they're all splitting or they taste funny. Or, but we had a cucumber plant once. I don't know what we did, but all those cucumbers were nasty. It was like, what is going on? This is a bad plant bearing bad fruit. It takes a lot of hard work to bear good fruit. It's not easy. It's going to require sacrifice. We even see an example later on in Matthew chapter 7 of of building on rock versus building on sand. I imagine it's very easy to just say, oh, here's a spot. Let's just start building. Guess what you're building on when you do that? Sand. But if you're saying, listen, I I want to build on rock, that's going to take some work. You're going to have to get out a shovel, and you're going to have to dig down and find a foundation. You're going to have to, it's going to be hard work to do it the upside down way. But what I also know is that Jesus' way, the upside-down kingdom way, is the path to real joy and happiness. I, I will gladly raise both hands as a testimony to that truth. Man, I have so much... I, 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 we just talked about humility, so please don't misinterpret this, but I have so much joy and happiness in my life. And I, I, I'm no problem pointing to Christ as the reason for it. We try in my family to do things God's way as best as we can. And I'm telling you, we screw up all the time, but we do our best to try to get back on the right course and to choose that narrow path and to to be trees that bear good fruit. And it's a lot of hard work, but it is the way to really find a sense of meaning and purpose and joy in your life. And then we segue into what I was talking about, the the scariest passage of Scripture in the Bible. Let's actually go there together. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 27. Here's what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day... Don't miss this next word. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and do many powerful deeds? 
And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you lawbreakers. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The the rain fell and the flood came and the winds beat against that house, but it did not collapse because it had been founded on rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the flood came, and the winds beat against that house, and it collapsed. It was utterly destroyed. Does that make anyone else pause for a minute? When my wife and I bought our first house in Delaware together, we had this little closet in the master bedroom, and it wasn't big enough for our stuff. So we invested in one of those Ikea wardrobes, you know what I'm talking about? And this thing was a beast. It was like three parts, and it had like the doors and stuff that pulled out, and it was awesome. And I, we bought it, and we loaded it up in the car, and we took it home, and it took a long time to put together. So I'm sitting there, you know, we had to move everything, you know, the bed had to be up against, we had like, we're, I'm putting this thing together by myself, right? I'm putting it together and I get down to like the last step and as I, you kind of get to this point where you, you attach them all, like here's this one and here's this one and here's this one and at that point I realized at the very beginning I had put something on backwards. <laughs> Has that happened to anyone else before? When I read passages like this in Scripture, it makes me think. Listen, I think I've got this, this awesome thing. I, I understand you know, that what's in God's Word is, is true, and I, I, I believe it, and I, I have this, like this, this thing. You know, I'm, I'm putting this, this life together, and I'm trying to do it in a way that's honoring to God, and I, I, I'm wondering, like, what happens if at the very end of this thing, I realize I'm standing before God, and I'm like, I got it wrong. I missed, like, an incredibly important part of this, and I'm standing there, and I realize, I'm saying, Lord, Lord, it's me, it's Matt, I was the lead pastor at Arundel Christian Church. And he's like, I don't even know who you are. That ought to make us pause. If you're sitting there right now thinking, wait, my pastor's worried about that? Yes. I mean, the the Bible's very clear. Like, people who are are teaching and, and, and prophesying in God's name are going to be deceived on that day, and God is going to say, I don't know who you are. And I want us to not walk away scared and just wondering, whoa, Matt, thanks a lot. I want us to maybe drill down a little bit and understand what does that mean? And I think one of the key things that if you're using one of these these Bibles in the chair back in front of you, it's missing a word that we see in the original Greek. At the very beginning of verse 24, there is a word That if you're using the NLT or the NIV, you probably see it there. It's the word therefore. And in the NET, for whatever reason, they didn't translate that word. But it's such an important word because what it's saying is, listen, there's there's the pretenders who think they're going to get into heaven and they're not. And then there's this idea of the wise and foolish builders. These two thoughts go together because of that one word therefore. Therefore, if you're wanting to know what, what is it, What's the difference between those who are expecting heaven and don't get it and those who are expecting a relationship with God and do? This word, therefore, is such an important word. And the way that, that goes on is it says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. That leads us to our fourth thing where we're going to spend the rest of our time. It's it's this. Doing makes all the difference. Now I really have to pause and provide a disclaimer here. Because 
you cannot work your way into heaven. You can't do enough good deeds to somehow, I, I did. Matt said, do, do, do. So I went out and I did, did, did. And now, ta-da, that's not going to work. I, I believe wholeheartedly because God's word is very clear that you are saved through faith. But if you want to know whether or not that faith that you have is genuine or whether or not you have been deceiving yourself all along, doing makes the difference. That's what Jesus is saying here. In fact, we see in James chapter 2, I kind of smushed two verses together, and here's what it says. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Because remember the game that we, well, many of us probably used to play when we were kids and uh, called uh, Simon Says? It's a real simple concept, right? You have one person who's Simon, and if, if Simon says to do something, you do it. And if the person just says the thing without Simon being somehow part of the equation, you don't. And, and it's, it's a real simple game, and it's easy to you know, trick little kids, and it's fun and whatever. But this, this idea is that we know that when Simon says to do it, we stop whatever it is that we're doing, and we do the thing that Simon told us to do. The concept is simple. And yet somehow, again, I'm picking on the American church because we, we have this, this idea that we, we say, listen, I choose to follow Jesus, but somehow when Jesus tells us to do something, we don't. This is what we do. We say, listen, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to learn about it. I'm going to go and I'm going to join a life group or a Bible study and I'm going to study what Jesus has told me to do. I'm going to figure out how to say it in Greek so I can really impress people. But when it comes to actually applying it and doing anything different with my life, listen, I'm doing it in my heart. And I want to be really clear that when I say doing makes all the difference, I'm not talking about busy work. If you hear this and you walk away thinking, I just have to go out and i got to do, 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 and stay busy, 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 because that's the difference. I'm not talking about doing. I'm talking about applying. When, when Jesus says to do something, apply it to your life. If, you know, we studied last week, you know, take some time to, to pray privately do that you know the bible tells us to avoid certain things that really just kind of makes god sad don't do those things apply it what i mean by doing is when you learn about something when god is picking on you and he's he's pointing out something and he's saying listen this is something that is really important that'll bring true joy and happiness when when you know the holy spirit is is prompting and we read stuff that we don't even have to wait for prompting. We can just read stuff in God's word. Do it. And I, I want to be really clear right now. That sounds really condescending, me saying, you guys have to do it. i got to learn this too. There's so much stuff in here every day. I'm like, man, why can't I just do what it says? In the start of verse 24... When it says, everyone who hears these words of mine, can we just stop right there? That's, that's what's happening right here. That's the being in church part. Everyone who hears these words of mine, you've come here this morning, congratulations. You're here. Jesus is speaking through his Sermon on the Mount, through the Word of God, and, and through me, and I'm, I'm sharing. Here's what the, the Word of God says. We are hearing it. And sometimes I've, I've found out that we, we kind of stop there. If you ask someone, hey, tell me about your, your walk with Jesus. And what they'll tell you is they'll somehow correlate their, their relationship with Jesus and their attendance in church. Tell me about your, your walk with Jesus. Well, I haven't been to church in a while. Like somehow that's the answer to the question. 
Or tell me about your walk with Jesus. You know, I, I, every year I take students on this international mission trip, and we have an application they have to fill out, and I ask them to share their testimony of how they gave their life to Christ on the back. And one of the questions, you know, it, you know the idea with a testimony is tell me, tell me about when you gave your life to Christ. And the answer on almost all of those is I've been to church my whole life. And I want to be really clear, going to church is not, it's not, it's a good thing, but it's not the thing. This is where you come and you, you learn and, and where you have an opportunity to, to fellowship together and to, to corporately worship God together. But if you have, have walked in this morning thinking, you know, I, I, I worked my way into the parking lot and I checked my kids in and I raised my hands during worship, I even felt emotional during one of those songs, you might be deceiving yourself. You might be so deceived that one day when you are standing in front of the kingdom of God, you're going to say, Lord, Lord, it's me. I was raising my hands that day in church. And some of us are going to be shocked. In fact, the Bible says many are going to be shocked. And that scares me. I want to point out some verses in, in James. James is a really cool book of the Bible because James is the brother of Jesus. And James is unique in that it is one of the, the, the books of the Bible that best com, kind of parallels the Sermon on the Mount. So if you want to take, here's what my brother Jesus said, and here it is in my own words. You basically have the book of James. And one thing that James says in James 1.22 is he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. That word deceive, I think what makes this so scary is that I don't believe there's going to be people who stand in front of God and know that they're fakers. They're not going to just be like, listen, I know we don't really know each other, but I'm going to try to convince you we do. I think that many are going to stand in front of God fully believing I'm one of yours. And they're going to be deceived. And when I think about my own faith, and I think about the faith of my wife and the faith of my daughters, I'm telling you, and I think about the faith of my church, I want us to be a church that doesn't just hear the word and so deceive ourselves, but we take it further. And James 22 ends this way. Do what it says. You know, if you ever need to like get in shape, you know one way to feel really good about yourself is to go to the Y and join it. You just got to go and join you walk in there feeling like I got to do something about my, my weight. I got to do something about my health. I'm going to walk into the YMCA. I'm going to fill out that paperwork. I'm going to give them a whole bunch of my money as a down payment to really confirm that I'm serious. And I am in. And you will walk out of that place that day thinking, yeah, I got a plan. I'm going to get this thing right. This, ugh, this is going to be looking good in summertime, right? You have this like you walk out of the YMCA feeling good about yourself. But we all know that if that's where it stops, you've deceived yourself. The YMCA does no good as a, you know, a thing in your pocket attached to your keychain. It has to be something you actually hand over occasionally and get scanned and go in and actually utilize the tools of the YMCA. We have to do what it says. Doing makes all the difference. And then James goes on in James 1 23 through 24 and it says anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like this is one of the best uh, verses in the bible this this a picture of one of us going up and looking at a mirror you guys know uh, we all know about the morning oh no, right? You stand in front of a mirror in the morning and you open up your eyes 
Oh, no. That's the morning oh, no. And we all know what the morning oh, no is because we have, we have counters full of things that are designed to fix the morning oh, no. When we go on vacations, we pack a whole bag just with the stuff dedicated to the morning oh, no. Right? The morning oh, no I actually went online and I wanted to find some pictures of, of actual things that exist to deal with the morning oh no. And I was surprised at some of the things I found. Here's, here's one of them. This is a Versio facial tanner. So this is a machine that you buy just to tan your face. That's sad. And I see that she's wearing goggles, so I really would love to see like at the end like the white circles around her eyes. I think that would be... Here's another one. This is is called Rejuvenique. Here's what Rejuvenique has. In it, there are little uh, metallic things that touch all these different spots on your face. And it sends electrical shocks and impulses at your face to somehow tighten your skin. And uh, it didn't last beyond, I think, the 80s, but... Uh, here's another one. <laughs> this one actually sounds like a really good idea to me. It's called Hair Illusion. <laughs> I think it's genius. You just have to stay out of the pool. I, I mean, I don't see why I picked that. That's a great idea for the morning. Oh, no. Here's a, a, a last one. <laughs> the Ab Enhancer. I love the quote they put at the bottom from Jeff. I couldn't believe how effective the ab enhancer was. Chicks dig it. (laughs) And it fits beneath clothing. So you just keep it on and walk around. You're like, yeah. See, that's my morning oh no. When I get in front of the mirror, I'm like, oh no. Um, But listen, when when we're young, we don't really care so much about the morning oh no. But when we get older... We, we know about the oh no, and we, we look in front of a mirror in the morning, and we see something that desperately needs our attention, and we don't stop there, right? We're not going to stop working on the oh no until it becomes no mo, all right? So, so we have, sorry, <clears throat> Brian, if you're watching this morning, um, <laughs> um, You see, it's ridiculous to us. It's ridiculous to imagine stepping up into a mirror and seeing something that needs to have uh, serious attention and then walking away and immediately forgetting what we look like. And James says that that's what we do. When we walk into a church on a Sunday morning and we sit down and or we, we sit t- you know, down in our, in our living room and we open up God's word and we open it up and we read what he has to say. Or we have someone praying for us and we're asking the Holy Spirit to reveal truth in our life. And then somehow from all that, things are pointed out. We look into the perfect law that gives freedom. We look into the mirror of the word of God and it says, listen, you have some big oh no's in your life. And yet, if you then take that and say, listen, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set it down. I'm going to walk away and pretend I didn't see that thing at all and keep going on with my life. We can't even imagine doing that. And yet, we do that time and time again in our walk with Christ. We, we allow the Holy Spirit to, to show us something that we need to, to change, to be transformed into the likeness of, of Jesus. And then we go away doing nothing about it. So here's what I want to ask you to do this morning. This is the application piece. I want you to start doing in one area of your life. I want you to... You already know what this thing is. This is the amazing thing about this. You already know that thing that you need to do that you're putting off. You already know that thing that God is asking you to to sacrifice and to give up. You already know what it is because it's been on your heart and it's been on your mind for a long time now and you're just you're going up to that mirror and you're walking away pretending that you didn't notice it. For some of you, that thing is that you need to give your life to Christ. 
You've been showing up at church maybe your whole life. And you know the gospel inside and out. You know that Jesus came to you. God loves you so much. He sent his son Jesus to this earth to die uh, on the cross. He was a perfect man who died on the cross and took over your sins and my sins. And he took them on himself on the cross so that you and I could have a relationship with God through him. You know this. This is something that's already you know, processed through your eardrums and into your head or through your eyeballs and into your heart. And you already know about the truth of the gospel. But you stopped there. You looked into the perfect law that gives freedom. You were convinced that you needed to take action. But then you stopped short. And maybe this is the morning you need to say, you know what, I don't want to, to be that guy anymore. I want to do I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. Some of you, you have already given your life to Christ and there's something else you need to do. Maybe for some of you, it's you've never submitted in obedience to baptism and you need to do that. Maybe some of you, there's something in your life that you need to say no to, a relationship that you need to get out of. Maybe there's Something that God's been asking you to do. Maybe it's this one more campaign. You've known for a long time, I need to be serving in my church and I'm not. I don't know what it is for you, but I know that in your life and in mine, there's something that we can be doing that we're not, that we ought to be. And it's that thing, this this doing that makes all the difference in understanding whether or not our faith is real or whether we're deceiving ourselves. So I want to encourage you, if you have a decision to make this morning and you want someone to talk to about it, we're going to have some of our prayer team down up front to talk with you. We'd be happy to pray with you about that. We'd be happy to uh, walk you through and, and a prayer and, and lead you into your, you know, start you in your relationship with Christ. We'd be happy to, to talk with you and pray with you about whatever God's calling you to this morning. But for those of you, everyone in this room, I want to ask you, what is that one thing that you need to to start doing. Let's put some action behind our faith. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you were glorified this morning. It's so hard to take your words and then somehow just process them and and, and re-teach them in a way that, that... I want to make sure, God, that you were glorified and honored this morning. So I pray that you were. I pray that everyone in this room, God, that we would know exactly what that thing is that we need to start doing and that we would put some action behind our faith. God, we don't want to have a faith that's useless and dead. We want to have a faith that's real. So help us to put action behind it, to choose the upside-down way to live. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.